Hello and welcome to Overtime Hockey Talk. My name is Mark Paul. My co-host Justin Baker and I excited to talk about who's real, who's not in the NHL. Teams, players, goaltenders, we're coming at you with Ed. Anything and everything that we can uh, we can squeeze into our show. Justin, good morning. Yes, good morning. How are you? Great. I, I feel like we don't typically do shows in the morning. It's like maybe one out of... 10 <laughs> that we do in the morning. Right. So I, I feel like I'm not used to actually needing to have some some energy. I know it's it's not that early right now. I mean, I was up two hours earlier yesterday. I, I woke up and drove two and a half hours to the other side of the state where my dad lives, where my parents just moved, and helped them build the frame of a deck. <laughs> and then when we were done, when it got dark, I drove back home. Oh, jeez. <laughs> so I worked for about, I'd say, you know, a good solid eight, nine, like nine hours. And I drove for five. Wow. That's <laughs> the worst. So it's a pretty bad work commute if you were going to do that every day. But, you know, the, the things you do for your dad, you just like, oh gosh. you know, you got to do it. Family, right? There's yeah, no, there's, there's, there's probably no one else that I would. I don't even know if I would do it for my brothers. <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> uh, gosh, I hope they're listening. <laughs> I, I feel well. You know, my old house. My dad came over. Like we were doing our, my bathroom. He would come over, like probably three or four times a week. He would like he would leave work, work all day, leave work, come over, and we'd work till like nine or ten, and then he'd go back home, go to work. Like he was coming over all the time and it was like a 20 minute drive, but I feel right. like cumulatively he's, he's banked a few five minute, five hour drives <laughs> <laughs> over my life. You know, that's, Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. I did a, um, I did a wedding, uh, man, a couple months ago I was, I was filming a wedding and no joke. I, I li- it was in, it was in Muskegon. So that was, whew. Oh yeah, about a two and a half hour drive, and going out there and coming back was just a nightmare. And yeah, I I was just like you. I didn't leave until, gosh, like ten or eleven o'clock at night, and driving back home, it was just long. There you go long for the, for those day. of you that uh, that aren't from Michigan. You know, you can hold up your hand, hold up your right hand, and like point to the the west side, kind of right around the bottom of your pinky, and you've got Muskegon. I, I think right. that's pretty accurate, right? Yeah, the weird things that Michiganders do. All right, well let's uh, let's jump in to all the things disappointing, or or not disappointing. All the things uh, <laughs> not disappointing. I don't know why I said that. You know why I said that? Because I got distracted because I tried to adjust my mic and it pulled right out of the freaking thing. So here I am trying to hold on to the whole entire apparatus of the mic while trying to also think about what I'm going to say, and it just didn't work. <laughs> it didn't That's happen. very disappointing. <laughs> yeah, it didn't happen. So we're not talking about disappointments. We're talking about whether or not the players that are succeeding thus far are for real. And there are some good ones, players and, and, and teams. Uh, I mean, let's just start with the fourth overall scoring forward in the NHL. And that's Troy Terry. Uh, I would venture to guess that coming into this season, even someone who who like follows the NHL pretty decently could probably not tell you who Troy Terry was. I mean, this is someone who had a like point three points per game coming in to this season with uh, you know in his first hundred and twenty nine games, he had. 48 points and now he has broken his career high in goals and points in 17 games <laughs> uh, and not to mention he's got a 17 game point streak unbelievable absolutely yeah. unbelievable that uh yeah what what he's doing it's it is crazy it, that's probably the craziest part is that this isn't like you know occasionally in the to start the season you have some guy who scores a hat, like a hat trick and then has like a two goal game. So early on they're they're pretty high up in the scoring because they had some monster games. 
I mean, he's putting up points every single game to start the year. It's, uh, you know, you talk about, I, people talk about uh, Connor McDavid sit, breaking the record for most points to start the season, like per game. Troy Terry's right there with Connor McDavid, which is so, <laughs> so strange. What, what, uh, how do you explain what Troy Terry has suddenly done? My gosh, it's so hard to explain what he's done. I mean, listen, this is this reminds me of a few years ago when Calgary was, you know, killing it at the top of the Pacific. And I think this is a an Anaheim team that everybody is playing above where I feel like they should be playing. Everybody's just exceeding expectations for lack of a better term. And I mean, you look at you look at this guy, Troy Terry here. He I mean, don't get me wrong, at twenty four years old, he's still got time to develop a little bit more. But I think right now he's kind of coming into his own. He's kind of finding his own voice. And this this Anaheim team here, they're you know they were supposed to be in a rebuild, right? This was supposed to be like we're starting fresh. You know, we just gave you know Ryan Getzlaff a one year contract because we're going to go year to year. We know we're re- rebuilding, so let's keep him around. But you know we're not going to pay him too much because you know he's not going to do much. But oh wait, Ryan Getzlaff is also putting up 19 points in 18 games, so. Yeah, and you, I mean, you you look at everybody: Kevin Shattenkirk, Adam Henrique. All these guys are playing way above and beyond where I would have expected them. And so, for a team so young with no expectations, there's no pressure there. And they don't. I mean, they're not like a Toronto team either, where the media is just or New York, where the media is just hounding down their back all the time. Nobody really freaking even knows because they're on the West Coast. So yeah, yeah. they're no pressure. They just go out and have fun. And I think it's it's really paying off for them because they can just go out there and. You know, I mean, this, this team has done they, – they're fun to watch. They're exciting to watch, to say the least, right now. Yeah, and, you know, it's – Troy Terry's emergence coincides with Ryan Getzlaff's, I, I guess, resurgence. And <laughs> the uh, the crazy thing about Getzlaff right now, he only has one goal. I mean, he's he practically is, you know, I guess set up Troy Terry on almost all of his goals. Uh Ryan Getzlaff is is a career 11.2% shooter. He's shooting 2% right now. And wow. It's not as if... I mean, Getzlaff has almost three shots a game. He's only scored once. I mean, what happened when, when Getzlaff starts shooting his career average? I mean, he's got... You know, you're, you're talking somebody who probably has five or six more goals than what he has right now as well. So not only is nothing going in for him... <laughs> <laughs> but he's still putting up big points because of Troy Terry. And I, I think that they maybe are just scratching the surface uh, with with what they can be. I I am not sold on the Ducks being this good in terms of, you know, are, are they going to make the playoffs? They're certainly taking advantage of the fact that Vegas is down, right? Like, over, or Vegas was down. I should say they're 7-3 and three in their last 10. But Anaheim keeping pace, eight one and one in their last ten. Uh, you know, I think we we talked about it on our last show how Calgary looked like mm, maybe they they won't stay up where they are. Uh, but you don't necessarily expect Anaheim to be the team to come back and snag their place. You expect Vegas to be the team that comes back and snags their place. Uh, so it's uh, but but now when you look at the rest of the Pacific. I mean, I think that most of the teams in the Pacific have actually been better than what we originally predicted. I mean, the LA Kings are 7-2-1 and one in their last 10. The San Jose Sharks have not been the worst, <laughs> which, I mean, I don't, I don't think they've been great, but they've still been, they've been five, they're 500 right now, slightly above 500. Uh, it's really like Vancouver struggling, Seattle's really struggling, and so is uh, Arizona. Oh, Arizona's in the Central, so they don't matter. Uh, <laughs> for for this conversation, uh, you look at it and you go, huh? Anaheim actually has a if if they can even play remotely close to this clip, they probably could make the playoffs. Uh, especially if they can stay hot for a little while, you know, and, and get themselves into a good position. Hey, remember if you're in the playoffs at Thanksgiving, there's a good chance you're going to be in the playoffs. And right. we are like a we're we're what seven six days five days out from Thanksgiving, so they, I mean things are looking pretty good for the Ducks thus far, and John Gibson has been great. 
You know, yeah, and that, that's the other thing that people don't talk about. John nine Gibson and three. I mean, so good. yeah, he's been fantastic. I, I mean, you just have to, you just have to weather the Stolars games. Although he hasn't been that bad, a nine one two save percentage. Uh, they just haven't scored for him the same way that they have for John Gibson. But I, I yeah, I mean, I'm, I am. Ex- the Ducks are one of those teams where you're like, yeah, I can get behind the Ducks. I, I would love to see them be good. Like, right. go and spoil some people and maybe get into the playoffs and and uh, see what they can do. I, Ryan Getzlaff has always been one of my favorite guys, and uh, it's it's great to see him have success. And you know, maybe a, a sped up rebuild. Who knows? Maybe the Ducks go out and they say, "Hey, we could we could go out and acquire somebody here at the deadline if if we don't have to give up too much." Obviously, they're not going to give up big draft picks. You know, if they could give up a third in a couple of years, maybe a second, just to to kind of get reward this team for the way that they're playing. They've got $11.7 million in cap space. I mean, they definitely have some, some room to wheel. Uh, and you know, all, all this to, to say they've been doing this without Ricard Raquel for the like nine games. I mean, he's only played eight games this year. So you would think, Hey, Ricard Raquel's not, is going to get hurt early on in the year. Mm, yeah, that's probably going to hurt the Jets' offense or the 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 Ducks' offense. And somehow they are like they're what the second highest te- scoring team in the Western Conference. It's awesome. I know. The yeah, only- and most people don't even think about it too. I mean, so when you look at playoff potential, right? The the Central Division maybe isn't as strong as we thought. Obviously, those teams at the top, Minnesota, Winnipeg, St. Louis, are looking like they'll be okay. But Colorado's been playing. They've been playing better as of late, but, you know, no Nathan McKinnon for a while. Uh, Nashville, are they for real or not? You know, Dallas not playing not playing so good. They, they've been having some coaching issues down there. It looks like, uh, you know, we could see an explosion or uh, some sort of uh, retooling here pretty quick. Chicago is, you know, obviously near the bottom. And Although I you know, will say that uh, you said on our last show that was 12 days ago, you said – that you thought that the Chicago Blackhawks had a, a little bit of a, like, that they may flip a switch and start to win some games. And since then, they are 4-1. and one. I think they lost the game the night we recorded, and they, yep. won, they won like four in a row. <laughs> so yeah, so mean, you, you had a, a good pulse on that team. Uh, since Patrick Kane's come back, they look much, much better. And since Jeremy Colton was fired. Well, that's, yeah, that's the big one, right? I mean, obviously, I didn't see that one coming for sure. And, you know, anytime you have a coaching change, you know, guys tend to grip the sticks a little bit tighter. Uh, you know, things seem to go your way a little bit more. You play with a little bit more energy and oomph. And, you know, who knows? They might cool off a little bit. But I still think this Chicago team, as weak as, you know, Dallas has been, is, you know, I'm still not sold on Nashville. So, you know, Chicago could take advantage and, you know, make some sort of rise here. And, I mean, don't forget, they they've still got a Vesna Trophy winning goaltender in that, so that's true. that changes a lot of things. That's true, and I I just I don't know if they can make up all those seven points, but crazier things have happened. I would say that they they definitely have talent. Like it's not like like there's there's just no way that Seattle turns this around right now. Like it's pretty clear <laughs> that the Seattle Kraken, the way that they pulled in players during that expansion draft that they valued certain low level players far too high. Like they were obviously desperate to, uh, to try and do this. Oh, well, this guy's going to be the next William Carlson, right? Like that was the conversation uh, during that expansion draft was, Oh, he, this guy has the potential to be the next William Carlson. Well, uh, sorry, but Jared McCann is not the next William Carlson. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, that's exactly don't. why the Penguins were, uh, I'm sure not like thrilled to just kind of toss him out. Uh, but they, you know, they, they let him go for, for peanuts. The Leafs used him as, Hey, don't, don't take our other guy. <laughs> and <laughs> I, I mean, McCann has been, he's been fine. Like, He's got ten points in twelve games. Not like he's not like he's struggling. Twenty seven point three percent shooting. So that that always helps. But 
uh, yeah, that they just overall can't seem to keep the puck out of their net either. That yeah, I feel bad for that goaltending tandem in there. Oh my gosh, I mean Grubauer eight seven five, Chris Drager seven ninety one save percentage. It's like you have guys who are world class goaltenders, and you would look at that duel and say, okay, cool. This is probably one of the top ten, you know, one A one B combos sure, in the league. Sure, but I mean, it just. It's it, funny because it's looking at their <laughs> looking at their defense, it doesn't seem like their defense would be the problem. Like right. Vince Dunn and Giordano, Adam Larson. You've got good top four defensemen up there. But, man, it's just not, uh, not coming together from a team defense standpoint. And, you know, some of that, I'm sure, is that they just haven't played together much. Uh, I think we look at Vegas and we go, wow, you know, you should really have taken advantage of that expansion draft and gotten your team to the Stanley Cup Finals in one year. <laughs> and it's just not it's just not how it usually works. It's why it, it's the first time in like North American sports history that it happened. It's not right. going to happen again. <laughs> so I, I think this is this is really what people should have expected. Like all the oh man, at that expansion draft thing when you had different people that were you know making the selections going, we're going to get this team to the playoffs. I was like, I don't know. (laughs) I don't think you should be, like, you should have told everybody going into that, don't talk about the playoffs, just talk about how exciting it is to have a team. Like, that's that's all you need, you know. Hey, we have a team. We're so happy to have a team. We're going to build the right way. We're going to build from within. We're going to build through the draft. Like, it's not sexy, but that's how you build a team that lasts for a long time. Like, they're they're good for a long time. Vegas took a weird, weird, weird approach. And they got, let's be honest, they got lucky because they were the first team. A whole bunch of teams gave away a ton just to protect these B-level prospects. And Vegas took advantage of that. Uh, Seattle did not, and obviously Seattle was asking for so much. Ron Francis just, what was it, like a first and a third to protect a guy? And nobody did it. <laughs> they were like, whatever, just take a guy. It's fine. Because the, the players that you're going to take, by and large, we can replace. And and that that has been true. Like, look at look at what St. Louis, I mean, they lost Jaden Schwartz and Vince Dunn. And St. Louis has been... More than fine. I don't know, like lately, they they've kind of been struggling, but they're sitting up uh, in the in the top of the central with Winnipeg and Minnesota. They're they've been fine. They they've managed. To, they've actually used losing those guys in order to bring up some of their younger players and have really reinfused the team. So that actually was like almost a benefit for the Blues that they had to give up a couple players. So. Jordan Cairo thanks you. My gosh. Yeah, he's been a revelation. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh that's another one. I mean, Jordan Cairo, Robert Thomas, Ivan Barbashev, they've all been really good uh for the blues. Well, where do you want to go next? Um you want to talk some goalies. I know you oh want to talk some goalies. <laughs> Would I love to talk some goalies? I mean, so I, for those who don't know, I mean, right now Jack Campbell's sitting atop the NHL as far as save percentage is concerned. But looking at the guys underneath him, and maybe are some more marquee names. Not to say that Jack Campbell isn't a marquee name, but um, you know, I'm seeing guys that maybe at the end of the year we probably won't see. Maybe a Jacob Markstrom, Jonathan Quick is sitting up there with a 940 save percentage after nine games. Uh, James Reimer. Uh, man, and then Carter Hart, obviously, he's he's had a resurgence. And, you know, considering his year last year, I mean, he's turned it around quite nicely. And so I guess I want to ask you, Mark, you know, looking at these goalies at the top of the pile here, who's for real and who's not? Well, I think some of this has to do with the, the team in front of him, right? Like Freddie Anderson, absolutely great start, which he doesn't normally have a great start. Uh, I think his stats are often... Uh, maybe shaded differently because he has bad starts. <laughs> and you always thought, man, if this guy could just avoid the first month of the season, he could be a, a, like pretty close to a Vesna candidate 
because <laughs> he he'd be so good sometimes, and then uh, but he would just have those bad starts, and then you know obviously once the pressure got on in the playoffs, uh, he couldn't really make that big save. But in a new market, a market where there's much less pressure, obviously, uh, I I mean I don't think that the that Freddie Anderson being up there is is that surprising given the team in front of him. I mean. The team in front of them is fantastic. They're probably the the best regular season team. Like the the way that they're constructed, uh, that the way that they play. I mean, this team could win the cup. They're 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 tooled perfectly to to really be one of those teams where you know. Uh, I mean, like almost like practically every team in the league, the right matchups and given. You know, nobody gets injured, like, or the the right players don't get injured. They could win the cup. You know, there's probably what seven, six or seven teams that are like that, where you go, eh, as long as they don't run into the hottest goaltender ever, uh, they could win the cup. And and that's the case, I think, for the Hurricanes. So Frederick Anderson, who is he struggled the last year, uh, but a weird year, anyways. I'm I'm willing to give almost anyone a pass on the last 18 months of hockey. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I think, I think this doesn't surprise me with, with how good he's been, especially with how good the hurricanes have been in front of him. Now it's ironic because the Leafs last year were actually from a team defense standpoint, like a top five team in the league. They were fantastic, but Frederick Anderson, I think, so, you know, sometimes I always thought, oh, this guy does a little bit better when uh, when he's got a lot of shots going at him. But uh, he's he's been able to do it for Carolina. So, yeah, I, I, I like the way that Frederick Anderson's been playing. I, I think that that will continue. I, I don't, it doesn't surprise me that he is where he is. Uh, but <laughs> are there some other guys up there? I mean, Jonathan Quick is in the top five of goals against 1.88. Uh, he's got a 940 save percentage tied with none other than Stuart Skinner for the Edmonton Oilers at 940. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan Quick I mean it's I it's good to see him having a little bit of a resurgence. Uh some of those I mean it's like the West Coast in general or a lot of guys are having a a little bit of a resurgence. And you know I wonder if the reason why some of these West Coast teams are doing better uh California had some of the the craziest lockdown rules in the United States. And I wonder sure. if some of the, some of the struggle was like just the way that they had to live when they were at home. I, you know, there's, there's so many weird out of hockey factors that happen. And we saw it like the whole West coast last year really was terrible. And all of them have been better this year. So I, I wonder if that has anything to do with it, but I'm I'm glad that Quick's having a a little resurgence along with James Reimer nine three eight save percentage. So uh, it's been it's been fun. I I do think I mean right now if you were going to hand out the Vesna, are you are you giving it to anyone else but Jack Campbell? If if we were basing it off only the first sixteen seventeen games, I I feel like it's hardly a question that Jack Campbell has not only been maybe the best goaltender thus far, but also he's been the Leafs best player, which there's a lot of freaking good players on the Leafs and he has been their best player. Like he is probably the reason that they're winning more so than uh, some of the, some of the other guys out there, <laughs> Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> don't get me wrong. I think Jack Campbell, as far as most in, I don't know if I want to say most improved, but I guess a guy who has exceeded expectations, right? I figured Campbell would come in. He would play fine. He maybe wouldn't play this good. Uh, and I don't think he's going to have this sort of sustained success as far as save percentage goals against for the rest of the year. Um, but I still think he's going to finish the year with, you know, 915, 920 save percentage. He's going to have some good numbers uh, because I think eventually you're going to see the rest of this Toronto team uh, kind of catch up to his type of play. And, uh, you know, he might no longer be the best player on the team anymore for the, you know, the, the next, you know, three quarters of the season. But for my money right now, if I had to pick one goaltender to say this is the Vesna guy right now, for me, it's Jacob Markstrom. Um, 
I mean, this guy is playing the lights out just like Jack Campbell. But when I look at the team in front of him, I think, you know, Markstrom has done a better job of just playing with less quality players in front of him. He's got a defense that just isn't, to, in my opinion, that great. And I, I like the makeup of Toronto's defense. They've got some really good, talented guys there. Now, again, defense has always been a question as far as Toronto's concerned, but I'm okay with what they've got. It's, it's much better than I think Calgary's, in my opinion. And the Ford group, too, as well. You know, he's, you know, Jack Campbell's going to get goal support. And I think, you know, Markstrom throughout the rest of the season isn't going to get it. And, you know, whether or not both of these guys can sustain their, you know, their numbers for the rest of the season is to be seen. But, you know, I think right now, you know, looking at an even playing field, I think right now I'm just going to give a slight edge to Mar- Markstrom over Campbell, in my opinion. Here's the problem, though. Could you give the Vezna to somebody who has lost more games than they won? Because well, that's I mean, the he, case for Jacob Markstrom right now. Six, three, and four. Sure, six, three, and four. Oh, so he's he's lost more games than he's won. Yeah, those overtimes definitely don't look nice. But at the end of the day, what people are going to look at is basically where they finished in the standings, right? I mean, and five I shutouts. That, five shutouts is is pretty remarkable when you consider coming into this season in three hundred and twenty five games. Jacob Markstrom had eight shutouts. And in 13 games, he is five. <laughs> right. <laughs> that, that, that is truly remarkable. I, that he has just a, like found another level to his game. Um, now, I will say that maybe it's more likely that Jacob Markstrom is a heart candidate than he actually is a Vesna candidate. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, because he's so valuable to his team. Uh, that 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 could play a play a portion. I don't know that anybody's ever won that a goalie's ever won the heart and not won the Vesna. But yeah, I don't he's think been so, <laughs> so good for his team. But has he been like? But at the same time, I mean, he. How can you you know what if a guy goes and wins forty games, and Markstrom's down there with twenty nine wins, but he's got fantastic stats. I don't know that you're giving him the Vesna. Well, I don't know. If, uh, you wouldn't give him the heart unless they made the playoffs. Yeah, you, you got to make the playoffs. No, um, and if there's that giant of a gap but, as far as you know, ten, eleven win difference. Can, yeah. can I just can I just say, in four games, Dan Vladar has been almost as good. So it's pretty clear that there's a a really good team defense for the Calgary Flames. And a lot of that has to do with Daryl Sutter and the way that he's forcing the Flames to play. So a lot of this, in in my mind, that's where, yes, Markstrom has been really good. Dan Vladar, almost as good, and it's Dan Vladar. Uh, So it's clearly something's happening with the team in front of them. The way that they're playing, they play this style where they... uh, they they very much are sitting back looking for opportunities. Nobody's out of position. They they're I mean I just watching them uh, not too long ago play the Leafs. They they just sit back and they're they're looking for those small opportunities to to score off the rush, and then the rest of it is just a dump and chase, dump and chase, dump and chase, and it's a very very methodical, a very I mean everything that you would imagine with Daryl Sutter and they have made a commitment to team defense. And I think they have the right players to do it. I mean, they, they've got players who are willing to listen and are willing to do what is necessary because I think of what has gone on for the last, like what, four or five years, the flames have been up and down, up and down, you know, make the playoffs, miss the playoffs, ha- you know, have a, a bad season and then blow everyone out of the water, but still can't do anything in the playoffs. And so I think you've got a lot of players who are willing to listen and willing to, to do anything to have success come playoff time. And I guess first you got to make the playoffs, but this is clearly a team in front of them scenario over, wow, Jacob Markstrom is just blowing the lid off this thing and uh, his team hasn't been good at all, but he's been fantastic. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. Uh, whereas I'd say, you know, you you look at the, the rest of the goaltenders 
that are kind of high up in this in the statistics. The guy who probably has been actually the best goaltender in terms of what he can do is probably Igor Shesterkin, which I think was he your Vesna pick at the beginning of the year? Yeah, he was. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. This guy is—he's something special in my mind, and you know he carried this New York Rangers team I think early on in the season, and now they're starting to to really get it together as far as team play in front of him, and so. Yeah, they'll, he'll be a fun goaltender to watch down the stretch now that he's going to get a more consistent team play in front of him. I mean, and you just go down the list. Like, John Gibson, I mean, how can he not be somebody who you go, wow, he's got to be a favorite for the Vesna Because I think he's played more than any goalie in the league. He has by uh, by 10 minutes. He's played 10 minutes more than Jack Campbell. Uh, I mean, he's 9-3, and three, a nine two six save percentage. Like... He has been great, and Anaheim definitely wouldn't be where they are without Jack Campbell or without John Gibson. So, yeah, you, you got it. Like, especially with the surprise of like they're not supposed to be good at all. Calgary, I think we we had Calgary as like oh, they could be a th- the third best team in the Pacific. Like that that wouldn't surprise us at all. But Anaheim, they were supposed to be last place. Like they were supposed to <laughs> give them or like, Seattle, right? Right, right. It was supposed to be that them and Seattle, maybe San Jose down at the bottom, and Anaheim's been rolling. So you look at that and you go, well, John Gibson has been a huge part of that turnaround. I mean, he's always been good, but nobody could score in front of him. And now they're scoring in front of him, and, and he's phenomenal. Takes a lot of pressure off a guy. Uh, now, are there anybody up there who you go, okay, this is like – you know, outside of Stuart Skinner um, or like a Dan Vladar, but people who are actually starting, anyone up here that you go, no, this is going to all fall apart pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, the one guy I kind of look to, uh, and I, I hate to call him out because I really liked him when he played in Carolina. I liked him in Toronto, and I just don't think the team in front of him is going to have sustain, sustained success the rest of the way because the rest of this division is only going to get better, in my opinion, and that's James Reimer. Um, I, I don't think a nine three eight save percentage obviously is realistic for the rest of the season. Now, you know, could this guy have a nine teens? You know, maybe get close to nine twenty nine nineteen something like that. Sure, wouldn't be out of the realm of possibilities. I think he's more than capable of doing that. But um, again, it really all depends on how much they were, you know, rely on him. How many games he starts? If they can keep him around forty to fifty games, you know, those numbers might be more realistic. But ultimately, I think you know, it, it really comes down to if. You know, if San Jose ends up having, you know, continued success, you probably won't see a dumpster fire. But if they start to fall off the wagon a little bit, uh, especially with a guy like, you know, for example, Thomas Hurdle, who's going to be a, uh, you know, a UFA after this season. I think, you know, you look at a guy like that who could get dealt at the deadline or could get dealt sooner so they can just kickstart some sort of rebuild. Um, You know, but I mean, Nick Benino is a guy who's playing at the top of the lineup and he doesn't belong there. Right. So. Uh, is that you know that kind of play going to last for forever? No. So, you know, Logan Gatcher is playing really great hockey right now. You know, again, Thomas Hurdle's playing good hockey, and uh, you know this defense, I just don't, I don't trust it long term. So, you know, outside of maybe Mario Ferrero, I, I don't think anybody else is really going to have any long term success on that blue line. I, I think Eric Carlson is just mediocre right now at this point in his career. Brett Burns, he's thirty six. <laughs> I mean, he's definitely not playing an eight million dollar game right now. So. To me, it's just it's just a, a matter of time before the wheels start to come off San Jose, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say this that they they look like they're enjoying playing hockey again, which is which is good to see. I mean, I think all the Vander Kane stuff. I think that that guy is just a, a poison in a locker room, and so I, sure. I I think that definitely played a factor. And again, I I, I do think there were some off off the ice things, uh, just with the way the world is. Uh, that affect, maybe affected the, the Sharks, but uh, it's yeah, it's going to be real hard for San. I mean, San, are the San Jose Sharks going to jump the Colorado Avalanche? No. Uh, the L.A. Kings, maybe. You know, Sh- Chicago is I think better than what they've been. Vancouver's definitely I think a little better than what they've been. I mean, I don't think that they're they've been they obviously haven't been great. There's something wrong with Elias Pettersson, uh, but. You, you don't necessarily expect 
that the Sharks going to outplay the Canucks all year with the the two rosters that they have. And the Dallas Stars are definitely better than than what they've shown thus far too. So there's just too much competition there for this Sharks team, I think, to survive. It wouldn't surprise me if they finish right where they are. You know, that kind of like, well, they it looks like they were close to making the playoffs, but they really never were. Like, I, I know right now that, you know, hey, they win tomorrow, and suddenly they're tied for a playoff spot. But I I think that this is probably a good start. I mean, they're 4-5-1 and one in their last 10. They started the season 4-2. Four, four and two. That helps. And I think you're probably more likely to see more 4-5-1s and ones over 10 games. And that's yeah, I think drop them quick. I think the San Jose team over the last five games is really – the true identity of this San Jose team. They were two and three. They they lost to Winnipeg, lost to Colorado, lost to St. Louis. I think those are games, you know, typically they're not going to win. Minnesota, I to be quite honest, is the way Minnesota's been playing. I was surprised by that victory too. And uh, beating Calgary four to one. So when you have to play, I mean look, their schedule over the next four games, they've got to play Washington, Carolina, Ottawa, and Toronto. They're gonna maybe come out with one win out of that. So like I said, it's gonna it's gonna fall apart real quick here. Uh, luckily for them, those next four are on at home, so maybe they might be able to pull out, you know, a second victory or, or steal another point or two. But, uh, you know, I personally think Washington or Toronto are going to run over them. They have no chance against Carolina, in my opinion. So, we'll okay. see. Okay, uh, I want to talk about a team that has been is is in first place in their division, uh, the Edmonton Oilers. They're twelve and four. They are the like the highest scoring team outside of the Florida Panthers in the NHL. They have absolutely unbelievable special teams numbers. I mean, they are scoring forty point eight percent on the power play, and their PK is eighty nine percent or is uh, yeah eighty eight percent, eighty eight point two. So in all. They're at what 123 percent for between the power play and the the PK, uh, which is just fantastic. You know, it's it's always been said, hey, if you can have if if your P- power play and penalty kill percentage can equal 100, you know you're doing pretty well. Uh, there are a few teams that are in the like 110 range, 113. The Leafs, the Flames are at 110. The Hurricanes are at 111. Uh, Ducks are at 112. But to be over 120 points between those two uh, is unbelievable. And I I have to say that I don't think they're going to score at a 40.8% power play for the rest of the year. Uh, That's a pretty enormous number. I I don't think that any team has ever scored at uh, at that clip. And to do it to do what they're doing on the penalty kill, almost ninety percent kill on the penalty, like that's pretty high. And I think that you'll see that number come creep down. You'll see the power play number creep down. It's not to say that they might not be the the they they are definitely the best power play, but like a top five penalty kill as well. But that's a that's a hard number to sustain through the year, especially on the power play because power plays get disseminated so much that eventually you got to think that that teams are going to start to find small holes in that power play and be able to expose them and you know hey you, you get an extra clear or two a game and that's the difference of you know maybe scoring twice in the power play and, st- and, and only scoring once because <laughs> at this point that's really all you can hope for with the Oilers is that they only score once on the power play right but but I'll I mean be, it really is. But I, I mean I I was at the the Wings Oilers game, and the Red Wings they managed to keep that power play in check. Like it's not as if, uh, it's not as if the goaltending uh, like Thomas Grice uh, had to to bail them out like crazy or Nadelkovich, Excuse me, he was in it. Uh, it was they they actually played really great team defense and managed to clear the puck quite often and stifle the Oilers power or yeah, their power play. So that, that to me says, you know, if the Red Wings can, had, had a good game plan coming in on how to take care of that power play there, there are going to be other teams that look at successes and start to poke at those things. 
So I, I do think that 40% is pretty spectacular, um, <laughs> even even through only, through 16 games. Um, I don't expect we see that high of a number at the end of the year. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I think 40% is unrealistic to be able to sustain it, I think, you know, realistically. You know, this team might finish somewhere between 25 and 30% on the power play, but that's still just an unbelievably good number. Um, yeah, the, the, hi- the highest, by the way, um, of all time is 31.4%. Uh, sorry, 31.9% is the highest okay. ever. Uh, 31.4, 31.2. The the Canadians have the highest, and then the two Islanders teams have the next highest. The highest in the... Now, the Oilers are pretty close, 29.5%. They, them and the Blues have the uh or the blues this year would would have that yeah okay so the the oilers from 2019 20 uh that's like the highest in this in this list of of teams it's the highest that that you can find uh really anywhere i mean the 2021 oilers as well or the 2020 2021 27.6 percent so i i don't think that they're going to bust the record by 10 percent no, no. I mean, look, right now, their first and second power play units consist of Connor McDavid, Ryan Eugene Hopkins, and Dry Seidel. So when you've got those three guys rolling on both units, I mean, they're going to see a minute 45 of power play time, you know, for, you know, two out of those two minutes every single time. And I think eventually, you know, I, I, I think eventually it's going to it's going to get less and less because you can't realistically put those guys out there for that long, especially once you get to February where it starts to grind a little bit more and the season starts to get a little bit harder. Right. Um, I think you're going to see a little bit less of them. But, I mean, look, you, you've got other guys on this team that are more than capable of, uh, you know, you know, contributing to a power play. I mean, they've got some some quality guys like Yamamoto, uh, Warren Fogle, who I really, really enjoy watching, Yessi Pooley um, You can give those guys a little bit more time. And, you know, again, they're not going to have the same success. But... I mean, any time. Look, anytime you've got Connor McDavid and Leon Draisaitl on a power play, they cycle the puck so well. They find those seams that other guys in the league just have trouble fitting the puck into. It reminds me a little bit of like, you know, I, I had the luxury of watching Dad Zook dish the puck like just uh, ridiculously good to, to players on the power play. Um, you know, granted the Red Wings didn't have as, as nice of finishers as you know uh, Edmonton has and Leon Draisaitl, but <laughs> not many people do. <laughs> right, but I mean, still, it's just. It's amazing to watch the way these guys can dish, dish the puck right now and, and cycle. It's just it. That's why they've been able to legitimately score almost every single game except for that Red Wings game this season. Because you know teams they they play a tight checking box. A lot of teams just play that that diamond style. You know they try to eliminate that center ice pass in the middle there between the the dots and you know let you play on the outside. And when you've got Connor McDavid at the point and Drysaddle on the half wall down low. I mean, Dreisaitl can be at a, a, a two-degree angle and still find a way to fit it in over your shoulder. That's how good this guy's sniping right now. So, you know, you can't give him any sort of room at all, and uh, he'll find the back door just about any chance he gets. So, you know, again, it's yeah, just... Will. Oh. <laughs> it's fun to watch this power play right now, and there's a reason Gretzky came out and said it's the best power play he's ever seen. Yes, yes. Uh, and uh, Gretzky on uh, TNT has been fun to, fun to watch. Uh Let's talk Nazem Kadri. 1.36 points per game. Uh he's he's got 19 points in 14 games. Uh we have seen Nazem Kadri score uh in in his career. He is a a 32 two back-to-back 32 goal seasons. Um but that was you know between 2016 and 2018 that he had those two seasons and his last four seasons he scored 46 goals combined. So, our last three seasons. Uh, so now five goals in 14 games, but he's putting up the assists. 14 assists. I mean, he is on pace to shatter his career high in assists, which is 30, which he did in like his first full year in the NHL. Um, I mean, he he should by by his pace right now by about game 35 he'll have 30 assists or more so what's what is the uh you know what's the secret sauce right now what's turning around Nazem Kadri's game well I think first off you got to look at the last few games I mean he's been playing 
top line minutes. He's getting more ice time because Nathan McKinnon is out, right? I mean, you look at against Vancouver, San Jose, he had a goal and two assists in each of those games, two assists against Seattle, nearly 20 minutes of ice time. That's because, again, he's he's filling in for, you know, a guy who typically will eat up 20 to 21 minutes a night in ice time in Nathan McKinnon. So uh, when you get an opportunity, too, to slot in with some other guys like uh, Landeskog and Rantanen, who, in my opinion, Rantanen, is really just as much of a line driver as Nathan McKinnon is um, because he doesn't miss a beat when McKinnon's out. It's, it seems like last year. I mean, you watch the way he played when McKinnon was, was out for a few games too. I mean, he has the luxury of playing on a team that's got so many talented players around him too that it just it becomes very, very easy. I mean, look, there, there's no shorting Nazem Kadri. He's, he's still a quality top six guy, but – you know, you could basically go to any other team. For example, I could probably pluck JT Miller, right, out of Vancouver, who, you know, again, is a top six centerman like Kadri, and throw him in this situation. He would be playing just as well because, again, I think this team is well balanced between guys they have on their back end, players they have up front, and they're getting good goaltending. So uh, when you have a system like that where guys just play so quick and so fast, you know, as long as you got the legs to keep up, and Kadri certainly does, it's just it's easy for him to have success. Yeah, and I I mean I'm I'm glad that he's having some success because he's obviously had a lot of uh suspensions in his in his uh <laughs> playoff repertoire that have I mean all but defined who kind of who he is. You know, that that's kind of been the definition of of his whole career is well, yeah, Nazem Kadri, good player, m- does the stupid things and screws his team over in the playoffs and so yeah who really cares what he does in the regular season he's bound to do something idiotic come playoff time I mean that's that's the I guess the the harsh way of talking about Kadri now it doesn't negate what he's able to do in the regular season you know it's uh, he obviously is somebody who he can put up some points I mean he's he's never really had a like a terrible year I guess I mean last year 32 points in 56 games that's that's a good year. I mean, you're talking about a year where you're, you're at with between 45 and 50 points, and if that's your low, that's that's not bad. Uh, but that's that's about what he's been his whole career, right? Right around that 50 point mark, give or take a little bit, you know. But over over the course of an 82 game season, that's that's about where he lands. I mean, he's on pace for like 100 points right now. Uh, right. It remains to be seen if if that's where he can, you know, kind of find himself in the end, but. Yeah, it's uh, it's one of those. Yeah, you know, I always rooted for him. I mean, I, he was a you know he's a Leafs guy. I'm a Leafs guy, so that that always helps. But I always liked his like his tenacity and and the way that he is able to do lots of different things, play a good a decent defensive game, and and at the same time like go in the corner and grind out and has a good shot. I I always liked his game, so it's good to see what what he's been doing early on. Uh, but you're right. Once Nathan McKinnon comes back and he's shuffled down the lineup. Now I will say his best seasons when he had 32 goals, he was shuffled down the lineup. He was the third line center when he scored 32 goals the first time because he, I think he does better against lesser competition. I think that that's always been kind of a thing for him that he needs to be put in the right scenario. And maybe we're seeing now where he's a little more experienced and he's, he uh, has, changed his game to be able to play with and against better opponents yeah no i can't disagree with you and you know another thing too is now you know before you know colorado in in last few years and somebody feel free to correct me if i'm wrong but um you know kadri has been relied upon too to also be a penalty killer right so now you don't have to throw him out there because you have a guy like darren helm this year you have you know a guy like Logan O'Connor who you can throw in there at those penalty kill minutes and, and really be those top guys that kill kill more time for you. So now your legs are a little bit fresher five on five, a little bit fresher, uh, you know, when you're on the power play there. And again, like I mentioned too, now he's getting top power play time with, with other guys in the lineup. And you have a guy like Berkowski too, who is, you know, typically his line mate on that second line uh, playing a lot better than he normally does. And so, you know, when you've got other guys around you playing better, you know, just obviously results in your play improving as well. Yep, yep, that's that's exactly it. Now, uh, can we just talk about Alexander Ovechkin before we uh, before we close out the old show? The machine. The, the machine. Uh, he, I mean, 
Oh man, what what can you say about a guy who probably the greatest goal scorer of all time and somehow he's better? <laughs> somehow this is like his best best year, maybe not from a necessarily from a goal scoring standpoint. Now, he has been very good at scoring goals. Uh but maybe maybe this is his best season because wow, all of a sudden he is getting point production and he's he's still scoring i mean 12 goals through the season the only guy with more is leon dreisaitl who has a ridiculous 17 he's like scoring a goal a goal per game pace which is uh unheard of let's it's, get a 50 and 50 yeah, right some maurice rocket richard crap here um now yeah ovechkin shooting a little above his career average shooting percentage he's still shooting the puck a ton he's got 26 points through 17 games I mean, he's on pace for like 130 points. <laughs> and and only two of those goals are on the power play. All right. He's got 10 even strength goals through 17 games. That is phenomenal. Uh, what do you equate to Ovechkin's success at this point? Because it's very clear that something's changed. Yeah, that's Especially the difference, in right? It's he, two power play goals. That's it, really. I mean, that's the crazy part. For me, though, the big reason why I think he's having such success is playing with the Birdman. I think the Birdman is playing some outstanding hockey right now. Uh, he's dishing the puck very, very well. And I'm hoping that, you know, again, when Backstrom finally does come back, that they don't shuffle the lines up and remove the Birdman from Ovechkin's side because I, I enjoy watching this top line with, with those two guys and Tom Wilson. It's just they're fun to watch. They're out there every night. They look excited to play. And listen, one thing that I caught on the radio the other day on XM that somebody said, and it really, really resonated. And I, I thought to myself, you know what, that that could explain so much because all the hype this year, especially with, you know, the NHL being on ESPN, being on TNT, you get a little bit more exposure to Gretzky. You have all this talk about will he get, catch Gretzky, right? Will he get there? Sure. And I think when players, especially like Ovechkin, who's been such a driven guy, you saw when you know, leading up to those couple of years prior to him getting a Stanley Cup, right? He had something to, to shoot for. He had that passion, that drive, and he literally willed his team to win the Stanley Cup that, that year. I think right now you're seeing an Ovechkin who has that drive, that determination to pass Gretzky. You know, it's just driving his play on the ice. And I mean, let's face it, too, this guy doesn't need to be out there and out dangle everybody. He doesn't need to be faster than everybody. As long as he literally goes out there and just rips it at the top of the circle, he can beat almost any goaltender at this point in his career. He's that good still. Um, and I mean, look, 16% shooting percentage is not that astronomical as far as no. above and beyond his, his, his numbers, right? His typical numbers. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he sustains this type of success. But right now, you know, if, if Washington can find some way to get Ovi going on the power play, his numbers could explode real quick, which is just sickening to think about. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, he is second in the NHL in points per 60 on 5-on-5. Five five. The only guy w- that has a better points per 60 number is uh, Timo Meyer, who is uh, just ripping it up 5-on-5, five five, but is, you know, still he's put up 13 points 5-on-5. Five five. Ovechkin's 17. Um, it's just Meyer's played less. But he's playing so well 5-on-5. Five five. Uh, which is which is a not necessarily like it's not like he didn't play well five on five in the past, uh, but we're seeing this kind of another side where he doesn't need the power play to put up a ton of points. You know, right now he, he I mean it's not like he's not producing on the power. He's got eight power play points so far this year in seventeen games. So you're still looking at a season where you end up with forty power play points. Uh, <laughs> He's also he also has a shorthanded goal by the way, uh, yeah that's that's rare <laughs> they, right right so yeah well, I mean, in, look, in his they're, career they're he's got five of them so out of seven hundred and forty two goals five of those are shorthanded uh, two hundred and seventy one of those are on the power play so percentage wise you know you're looking at like a little less than twenty five or a little more than twenty five percent of his goals have been on the power play and this year uh, you're at like fifteen percent so that's it shows you how well he's been playing five on five. Yeah, I mean, look at this team. Their lineup's been decimated. So they've got Backstrom, Manta, Lars Eller, TJ Ochi's out. So when you've essentially got a second line missing from your team right now, 
Uh, obviously, it's translated into more ice time. I mean, he's pushing 21 plus minutes a night right now, uh, which is crazy. So that kind of you know alludes to that shorthanded goal. So maybe they've got to throw him in there for 10 or 15 seconds of penalty kill time a night just to give <laughs> some guys a break. I mean, right. <laughs> you can only throw Tom Wilson or you know a guy like. Uh, you know, Kuznetsov on the the penalty kill so much because they've got to play so much five on five time. So, uh, boy, I mean, this this Washington team has been fun to watch. I mean, I figured they would have some sort of, um, you know, they would start to get into some sort of decline as well as I thought Pittsburgh was going to, especially with Crosby and Malkin being out. Now, Cro- now Pittsburgh obviously is uh, definitely hit the bottom of the barrel as far as standings are concerned, but. I mean, this Washington team has not missed a beat at all. Dude, they've been <laughs> great better. defensively, too. They're yeah. fi- fifth in the league, goals against, only 39 goals allowed, and they're fourth in goals for. I mean, it just doesn't look like anyone's missing. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, I now, I mean, they they certainly have have uh, helped themselves by pushing a lot of games to overtime. You know, they, they've lost five games in overtime already. Uh, them and the Calgary Flames have really boosted their numbers by losing in overtime instead of regulation. But, uh, you know, that's that's the way the cookie crumbles. But that's a yeah. uh, that's helpful. Take what you get. But, man, they yeah, they just have been – they've been very good uh, five on five. And, you know, it's, it's weird to see a Capitals power play ranked 21st in the league at 17%. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> But and again, that's when you're missing a guy like Baxter. When you're missing Oshi, sure. you know when you have these top guys out. Yeah, of course your power play is going to suffer a little bit for sure. Right now, now their penalty kill has been pretty decent. I mean, it's tenth in the league, eighty three point seven percent. So there you go. You're above a hundred uh, for your special teams, which at this stage in the season, uh, I I I think you know you see some ele- elevated numbers in special teams uh, at this point. So, but I. If if they could stick there all year, you know, maybe a little, uh, somewhere a slightly above a hundred, you're, you're still not in a bad spot, especially when considering the way that they're scoring five on five. They, they, I mean, there's there's really nothing to complain about when you can score that way. I mean, who wouldn't rather, you know, I'll take a so so power play, but a phenomenal five on five team because that's what the playoffs are coming down to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And not not to mention, too, when we look at everything else outside of those special teams, their goaltending right now, Sam Sonoff and Vanacek, is just playing okay. It's not playing great. I mean, their numbers are 9-11, 9-14 save percentage. I mean, it's not like it's world beaters. They're carrying teams like John Gibson or, you know, Jack Campbell might be doing right now. So if their goaltending stays where it is, they're, they'll be in good shape. And if they can get better goaltending, this Washington team will be uh, a lot of fun to watch down the stretch. Yeah, and one thing to note for the Capitals, something they've done really well. In 17 games, they, right now they're second in the NHL with goals against in the third period. They've only allowed 10 goals in the third period. The only team better, the Carolina Hurricanes, who have allowed six goals in the third period. Wow. Uh, which is just crazy. But, I mean, granted, they, they've only allowed... Uh, uh, I They've only allowed what? Uh, 20, how many goals? 28 goals against. <laughs> yeah. Which is hilarious. Like, it's just so good that it's funny because uh, I guess the Flames are next. There's six goals behind them. Uh, they've been pretty great too, but yeah, that goals against in the third period, that plays a huge factor in uh, your confidence. It shows how confident the, the Capitals are keeping the puck out of their net. They can keep leads and that is so key, not allowing those goals in the third. So, uh, whereas on the flip side, you look who is last, the Seattle Kraken. They've allowed 24 mm-hmm. goals in the third period. The Colorado Ooh. Avalanche, 23 goals in the third period. Montreal, 23 goals in the third period. The Red Wings, 23 goals in the third period. So, you you look at some, like the way some of those teams have played, particularly Seattle, Detroit, and Montreal, uh, Seattle and Montreal played just downright bad. Uh, same the Canucks twenty one against they they play bad. Uh, the Red Wings, who are a team on the rise, you look at a at a young team, and of course the third period is the the period where all the pressure mounts, where teams take all their energy and, and put it into trying to score on you, 
And, you know, this young team hasn't quite figured it out yet in the third period where teams are able to creep back into some games against the Red Wings. And that that's just a part of the growing process. But uh, generally, I think you can look, look down the list and go, uh, yep, if you are allowing a lot of goals in the third period, it probably means that you like something is something's up. You're struggling now. The Avalanche being that low, obviously they're not terrible, but they they went through a stretch where they were pretty, pretty things were pretty rough. Um, but they'll figure it out. But I mean, you look at the the bottom six teams and goals against in the third period, and five of them are under well under 500. Four of them under 400. So uh, it's just a pretty good indicator as to to how you deal with the pressure of uh of being up or just f- collapsing in the third all right any last thoughts before we say sayonara yeah you know i i saw or listening to you to you talk about freddie anderson a little earlier made me think when i'm looking at the standings here uh it makes me glad that carolina should they make the playoffs which i have no doubt they will uh, won't have to face boston at least in those first two rounds <laughs> So you won't have to worry about a game seven with Freddie Anderson against Boston, at least there, in the first yeah, two rounds there you go, Carolina. Yeah. <laughs> Freddie Anderson, I'm sure, is thrilled about that. Although there <laughs> is, I mean, if they finish first in the Metro, then they'd be playing one of the wild card teams. So they could technically play Boston in there. Very true. <laughs> so, but I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> so it's it's always out there. You, uh, I mean, yeah, with Bo- Boston has only played 13 games. Oh, they're definitely still, still in the hunt. Um, Oh, one other really weird thing um, that I, I don't think has gotten enough attention. The Islanders have obviously struggled. You know, five, six, and two in their first 13 games, only 12 points. Uh, you know, uh, people aren't really paying attention to the fact that they have played their first 13 games on the road. Like, when's the last time that happened? 13 yeah, games I mean- on the road. <laughs> They're getting a new building. I mean, that's that's the problem with getting new digs. Sometimes, you know, it kind of gets delayed. And, you know, obviously COVID played a big part in that. So they'll have a new place to call home. And I think their the first game is tonight. So It, it that is be, indeed tonight, yep. Yeah, I don't know if Josh Bailey's going to be available for that game or not. But, I mean, you know, that kind of sucks for him. But outside of that, I think the fans are excited. I think they're gonna you're going to start to see them kind of go on a little bit of tear because they're going to, you know, they – they're just barely keeping their head above water on the road for 13 games. And you think about it, you only played 41 on the road. So you got 13 of those out of the way right now. And you did okay as far as records concerned. So, well, I mean, last year, obviously a playoff team, the Islanders 11, 13 and four on the road, 21, four and three at home. Like this is a team that plays well at home. I mean, the year before that, 29 and 6 at home, 15, 14 and 4 on the road. Like they have your like stereotypical, hey, that's that's a pretty good team. Terrible on the road, great at home. Yeah, it makes no sense now, but the, the year before that, 24, 13 and 4 at home. They had a they had a, a basically an equal road record uh, in 2018-19, but this is a team that plays well at home. They need to be home. So I, I think you'll see their record. I, I think they will they will creep their way back into a playoff picture when they're playing at home. For some reason, they just play a, a different game at home. And, uh, you know, it, they, they have some games in hand on teams ahead of them. It's a Barry Trotz-led team. I, I think you'll see them score more than, tw- than two point two goals a game over the the course of the whole season. So I think uh, the Islanders will probably find their way uh, up the standings in the Metro, which is I'm sure terrifying a little bit for the rest of the teams in the Metro because <laughs> some of these, you know, Columbus has had some success. New Jersey's had success. And uh, it's, it's going to be a little bit tougher once the Islanders get going. All right. Well, that's our show. Justin, have a great rest of the day, by the way. Congratulations on closing on your house. That's fun. Oh, thank you. A new house is always fun. Now get to work. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, For those who don't know, I'm completely gutting my house yeah. and redoing it, so it yeah, should a, be a lot of fun. That's a party. That's what I'm doing to my whole second floor. That's what I got to go do right now. So uh, I'm going to get to work. <laughs> You're going to get to work, and uh, we'll talk soon. And you can find us on Twitter, at OT Hockey Talk. Hope you enjoyed the show. Let us know what you thought, and we will talk to you guys soon. Bye.